When we look at the sad situation of the Jordan River today, with all its mud, it is impossible not to think about the path that Jesus took to get closer to humanity. Even though he was divine, he chose to be baptized, demonstrating great humility. In that same Jordan River, an impressive phenomenon occurred that makes us reflect on divine gifts. But you know what is even more surprising. In the same place where Jesus was baptized, something happened that left everyone perplexed. A mysterious pool with an intense blood-red color was found close to the Dead Sea, and the strangest thing is that it is fed only by the Jordan River. This discovery has left people in Jordan and Israel full of doubts about everything they believed about this region, which previously seemed so desolate. So here is John the Baptist baptizing people in the Jordan River, probably in the same general area where Joshua and the nation of Israel crossed the Jordan. Great crowds are coming out to see him and respond to his preaching. Of course, the Pharisees are there to see what this is all about. John the Baptist is questioned about who he is. Anyone who was Jewish knew the story of Joshua and the importance of crossing the Jordan, and it was here that God signaled that he, God, who had exalted Joshua before all Israel, would now continue the deliverance of his people from the captivity of sin that began 1,000 years earlier when they first crossed the Jordan. Now the question is eyes, what is the truth behind this event? Could it be a sign of Jesus returning and bringing great challenges for humanity? I ask you to stay until the end and do not stop following this fascinating search to understand the mystery of the A bleeding in the Jordan River. A small puddle of water near the Dead Sea in Jordan acquired a deep red color, similar to blood, creating a wave of confusion and questions. So, let's talk about this incredible story from the Jordan River region. You know, in biblical times, this area was an important stronghold of the Moabites, called Kirharth or Kir of Moab, and now scientists are trying to understand why the river water turned red. Where theory is I peer it could be because of iron oxide, algae, or perhaps some substance people threw in there. One idea is that the red color comes from manganese in the water. When there's a lot of manganese, the water can take on a color similar to iron. But even with all these explanations, we still aren't sure what really happened for the river to suddenly turn red. Sometimes, science can't explain everything, right? And of course, this left many people scared and confused. Some are asking, could this red river be the blood of Jesus? We always hear about the blood of Christ in the New Testament, right? This refers to Jesus' sacrificial death and the work he did for us. When the Bible talks about the Savior's blood, it means he really bled on the cross, and more importantly, that he died for us, the sinners. The blood of Christ has enormous power. It can forgive many sins of many people from all times, and those who believe in this blood will be saved. Of course, what appeared in the Jordan River wasn't real blood. If it were, it would have caused huge chaos. But think about it. What if God used this red color as a metaphor for Jesus' blood? The blood was shed and maybe Jesus is returning. Rivers turning red remind us of the first plague God sent to Egypt. The Bible says that all the plagues will return more intensely when the Messiah arrives. Just as God punished the Egyptians with ten plagues, he will show even more power in the final redemption. So this red river might be a sign of punishment or that God is returning. Jesus will come back, but what does that mean? Will it be punishment like God did in Egypt or salvation? This could be a sign from God, a warning for us to get ready. Even if a scientific explanation is found, it doesn't mean it's not a divine sign. With everything that's happening in the world, it makes sense to think this way. It's not the first time a body of water has turned red. If the second coming of Yeshua, Jesus, is near, there is no need to be afraid. This could be a sign of salvation. The blood of Christ not only redeems us from sin and eternal punishment, but also purifies our conscience to serve God. Now we are new creations in Christ free from sin to glorify and enjoy God forever. The blood of Christ is for our redemption to satisfy God and to have peaceful fellowship with Him. We had a debt we couldn't pay, but Christ paid for us. He condemned sin in the flesh crossing the Jordan River. That's powerful, right? Yes, this could be a sign of punishment, but also a sign that God is returning. Jesus will return, but will it be a punishment like God did in Egypt or a salvation? This is a sign from God using the elements of his world to warn us and prepare us for him. Even if a scientific explanation is found, it doesn't mean it's not from God. Given all the other recent events, we would see this as a sign from God. It's a sign from God.
There are many other signs of all kinds that have happened, and this isn't the first body of water to turn red as blood. Don't be afraid if the second coming of Yeshua is near. This is something to look forward to. The blood of God saves humans. As mentioned above, it's more likely that this river of blood represents the blood of God and has more meaning than you might think. These scenes are the reality of Christ's blood, as a means of atonement for sin, has its origins in the Mosaic Law. Once a year, the priest was to make an offering of the blood of animals on the altar of the temple for the sins of the people. In fact, the law requires that almost everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. But this was a limited blood offering in its effectiveness, so it had to be offered repeatedly. This foreshadowed the unique sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Once this sacrifice was made, the blood of bulls and goats was no longer needed. Christ's blood is the basis of the new covenant. On the night before he went to the cross, Jesus offered the cup of wine to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The pouring of the wine in the cup symbolized Christ's blood, which would be shed for all who believed in him. When he shed his blood on the cross, he abolished the old covenant's requirement for continuous animal sacrifices. His blood was not enough to cover the sins of the people, except temporarily, because sin against a holy and infinite God requires a holy and infinite sacrifice. But these sacrifices are a yearly reminder of sins, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. While the blood of bulls and goats was a reminder of sin, the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, fully paid the sin debt we owe to God, and we no longer need sacrifices for sin. Jesus said, It is finished, when he was dying, and he meant exactly that but the entire work of redemption was completed forever, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Not only does Christ's blood redeem believers from sin and eternal punishment, but his blood will purify our consciences from useless acts so that we can serve the living God. This means that not only are we free from having to offer useless sacrifices to obtain salvation, but we are also free from having to rely on useless and unproductive works of the flesh to please God. Because Christ's blood has redeemed us, we are now new creations in Christ, and through His blood, we are freed from sin to serve the living God, glorify Him, and enjoy Him forever. The sprinkling of Christ's blood is for our redemption, for God to be satisfied, and for us to have peaceful fellowship with God based on the blood of the Lord. This is typified by the sprinkling of the blood of the sin offering offered for the atonement of God's people on the Day of Atonement. The blood of the sin offering was brought into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the mercy seat, and also sprinkled on the bronze altar in the outer courtyard. The mercy seat is the lid of the ark in the Holy of Holies, and under this lid are God's law, the Ten Commandments, as God's people cannot fulfill God's commandments. Instead, we transgress, fail, and commit illegalities. Therefore, bloodshed must occur for us to be redeemed and brought back into fellowship with God. Christ came as the unblemished, clean, and pure Lamb of God and offered Himself once for sin. Through His single sacrifice on the cross, we were all redeemed. Christ offered Himself to God as a sacrifice through the Eternal Spirit, and His redemption is eternally effective in space and time, being real and applicable to anyone who believes in the Lord. What we see in the Old Testament is a covering of sin by the sprinkling of blood, which is a type of Christ's true sacrifice, shedding His eternally effective blood for all men to be cleansed. In the Old Testament, we see the covering of the blood of the offerings so that God's people can fellowship with God. But in the New Testament, we see Christ, who came to accomplish redemption by offering Himself as the propitiatory sacrifice to remove man's sin. How we thank and praise the Lord for coming to redeem us, shedding His blood on the cross, not just for the covering of sins, but for the washing, cleansing, and removal of sins. Now, based on the sprinkling of Jesus Christ's blood, sinners can approach God, not based on their own merits or righteousness, but on the blood shed on the cross. We had a debt we couldn't pay our sins, mistakes, transgressions, and faults, but Christ came to pay a debt he didn't owe. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, and regarding sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So far, the messages that God has given to humans always point to the same destiny. Salvation, his blood flowing in the river, is the clearest sign of this. As Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. 
No one will snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them from my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. He clearly demonstrated the special protection He has for His children. No one can harm us if we are children of God. He may give us a sign to awaken us, but He absolutely will not harm us. And speaking of this sacred Jordan River, I also want to tell more about His salvation through the sacrament of baptism to strengthen your faith. Even if God makes red blood flow throughout the river, He still wants to hold your hand. Crossing the Jordan was a significant event for the nation of Israel. They had just spent forty years wandering in the wilderness, preparing for this moment. The adult generation that left Egypt but refused to enter the Promised Land had now died except for Joshua and Caleb. After those who would cross that day, many were children when they crossed the Red Sea with the Egyptian army behind them. Others were born in the wilderness and knew only the stories. Many remembered the cloud and fire pillar that led them. Jesus tells us, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now focus on what John the Baptist said when he recognized that this was the Lamb of God, the one who knew no sin. John the Baptist tried to prevent Jesus from being baptized by him. But Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. This baptism of the one whose name is Jesus, the sinless Son of God who knew no sin, is part of Jesus doing what he said he came to do, to fulfill all the law. This is key. Jesus had to fulfill the law of Moses down to the smallest detail, to fulfill all righteousness. It is this righteousness that clothes us when we are saved. Through this story you should have seen the importance of the Jordan River in biblical history. Therefore it is not surprising that in this sacred place, God wanted to send the message He wanted. I think it's God telling us to repent and accept Jesus as Savior, for He will do this in His wrath in the tribulation, so that the world will wake up and turn to Jesus today. He is both God and man. God knows what He is doing and uses us to move forward with His plans. The waters of the Nile turning red are still a sign for people to wake up and be ready for His return. This time the river water turned red, but next time it might be something more terrible. The day of the Lord's coming will be soon, and you need to be ready. This would be a different moment. They were not led by a cloud and fire pillar, but by the Ark of the Covenant, representing God's presence with them. When Israel crossed the Red Sea, it was a picture of the believer being freed from the slavery of sin. Here, crossing the Jordan, is a picture of the believer claiming their spiritual inheritance in Jesus Christ. Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ who leads us day by day into the inheritance he has planned for us. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they revered him all the days of his life just as they had revered Moses. Israel entered the promised land in time to celebrate Passover. Notice the reverse order compared to the first Passover in Egypt. In Egypt, Israel celebrated the first Passover by putting the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts, and the angel of death passed over their houses, and everyone inside was saved. Sin, the firstborn in Egypt who did not have the blood on their doorposts, died. The nation of Israel, led by Moses, left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. Now under Joshua we see the parallel, but in reverse order. Instead of Passover and then crossing, we have crossing and then the celebration of Passover. When we are saved, the blood of Christ is applied to our hearts, and we are no longer under the death sentence, which is God's judgment and eternal separation from Him. After our baptism by the Spirit, we enter the promised land, which is the abundant and Spirit-filled land there. We observe the Lord's Supper, which memorializes the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. About one thousand years later, Another Joshua arrived at the Jordan River, where a man named John the Baptist was baptizing people, calling them to repentance. The name Joshua comes from Yeshua and is the root from which the name of Jesus is derived. Yeshua or Joshua means Jehovah saves. When Mary is visited by the angel Gabriel, she is told that she will become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and should name this child Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Savior. He is God incarnate. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Lord. We should call upon the name of the Lord and we will be saved, no matter what language you call upon Him in.
Whether Hebrew, Greek, English, Spanish, German, Korean, or Chinese, it is the name of the Lord. Christ simply means the Anointed One, which also means Messiah, as in vomage on other Joshua, the very Son of God, who became flesh and dwelt among us, people wanted to know, who are you, John the Baptist? John answers, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. I baptize with water, but among you stand someone you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I said, After me comes a man who has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Why did Jesus, who knew no sin, need to be baptized? He tells John the Baptist and E.U.S. that it was proper for this baptism to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus identified himself with men and also with our sin. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. This act is the first act of his ministry to identify with us and also his obedience in doing everything that God commanded him, including enduring the shame of the cross for the joy set before him, which was to become the author and perfecter of our faith. To understand this, we must remember what Jesus said he came to do in relation to the word of God in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. 